So we're going to get started so we can use this time uh, as, as fully as possible. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, I'm Steve Werblow with the Conservation Technology Information Center, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to the uh, second webinar that we've had in the past uh, four weeks or so. Um, if you didn't catch our last webinar, it was uh, Sarah Lehman's uh, presentation on the history of NARS, and you can find it on YouTube. Um, go on YouTube, search for Conservation Technology Information Center. It'll bring you to our channel and you can catch the video there. It's a really great presentation um, and gave really neat context uh, to, to the work that uh, so many people are doing out in the field uh, and in the lab. Speaking of Sarah, we, uh, she and Danielle Grunsky have really led a great charge on the uh, NARS webinars and working with an advisory team have um, uh, been working hard on our uh, next pro uh, project, which is gonna be a three-day national NARS workshop, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. So um, we, we encourage you to set that time aside on your calendars and join us for the uh, workshop. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, itinerary soon, uh, agendas. It's, it's really going to be outstanding. Um, today is kind of a, a neat preview to that, uh, or prelude. It's a special treat. Uh, we're setting the stage for some discussions at that April workshop about how EPA selects uh, research indicators and what value those indicators can, uh, can provide. And we're keeping um, the agency's promise to report back uh, on the indicators that the uh, NARS partners have supported and contributed uh, time and effort uh, in the field to, uh, to make them possible. So um, we've got five great presentations today. And after each presentation, we'll spend a couple of minutes uh, on Q&A. So if you've got a question, please type it into the chat. You can find the chat down the bottom of your screen. Um, type questions, we'll try to moderate those, group things together if they're like on like. Um, and if we don't get to answer questions because of time or because of uh, uh, you know, the technical nature of something, we, uh, we'll get back to you with an answer. So uh, this way uh, we hope to, uh, to make sure everybody's questions are addressed. Um, in the meantime, we are going to get started with our very first uh, presentation. I'm gonna stop screen share. If I can do that. Um, and I'm going to introduce our first, um, first presenter. So Jake Bollier um, is a research ecologist in the EPA's National Risk Management Research Lab. His expertise in field work to estimate emissions of nitrous oxide, CO2, and methane give him great perspective to share in today's presentation on dissolved gases in lake. So I'm going to hand it over to Jake's uh, presentation and then he will be with us to, uh, to answer questions afterwards. Thanks again. I'm Jake Bollier with the US Environmental Protection Agency. And today I'll, I'll be providing an update on the dissolved gas indicator included in the 2017 National Lakes Assessment. While it's been long known that the biosphere plays an important role in regulating the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's only relatively recently that scientists have begun to recognize the important role that freshwater ecosystems play in the global greenhouse gas budget. Here's a figure from the IPCC's fifth assessment report where for the first time, uh, they include an aerial, an arrow depicting the exchange of greenhouse gases between freshwater ecosystems and the atmosphere. So we have an estimate of the magnitude of this flux at the global scale, uh, but the estimate is relatively poorly constrained, primarily due to a lack of direct measurements of greenhouse gas concentrations and fluxes in freshwater ecosystems. So one of the motivations for including dissolved gas measurements in the 2017 National Lakes Assessment was to generate the database needed to improve and better constrain estimates of greenhouse gas fluxes from freshwater ecosystems in the United States. The 2017 National Lakes Assessment included measurements of quite a few different variables at different locations within each water body. But for the dissolved gas indicator, all samples were collected at the index site, so approximately the middle of the water body, and all samples were collected in triplicate. So one of the indicators that we looked at was the dissolved nitrous oxide concentration. So nitrous oxide is a potent greenhouse gas that's been accumulating in the atmosphere. 
And since the late 90s, it's been thought that surface waters are a really quite important source or a large source of nitrous oxide to the atmosphere. And the mechanism underlying this is that nitrous oxide emissions from surface waters are linked to the runoff of nitrogen containing fertilizer into these water bodies. Uh, that fertilizer is then subject to microbial metabolism, which converts nitrogen to nitrous oxide, which is then emitted to the atmosphere. So this paradigm was recently called in question by a survey conducted um, in Canada where the investigators found that the majority of the water bodies that they surveyed, which were all small agricultural ponds, were actually functioning as a sink for nitrous oxide. I'm really calling in the question um, whether or not water bodies are, are a net sink or source of nitrous oxide to the atmosphere. And the National Lakes Assessment data set uh, is, a, is a great opportunity to revisit this question uh, with really the most robust data set on dissolved nitrous oxide concentrations that's ever been collected. So this figure shows the results of our direct measurement. So this is our the NLA uh, sample set. Um, the size of these circles correspond to the observed nitrous oxide concentration and the color of the symbols corresponds to whether or not these water bodies were functioning as a source of nitrous oxide if they're black or a sink if they're white. So what was really quite surprising is that 67% of the water bodies that were sampled uh, in NLA 2017 were actually functioning as a sink uh, for nitrous oxide. We use the NLA samples to make inference the population of water bodies within each of the ecoregions um, using the underlying um, survey design statistics um, built into the 2017 National Lakes Assessment. So what we're looking at in this figure is the proportion of water bodies within each of the nine main ecoregions that were undersaturated, in other words, for, uh, acting as a nitrous oxide sink within each of the ecoregions. So in the first row in, in the Northern Plains, um, we found that greater than 75% of all the water bodies within the Northern Plains ecoregion were actually consuming nitrous oxide uh, from the atmosphere. And the error bars are the 95% confidence interval of the mean. Um, at the other extreme, so the lowest, the bottom row in this figure is the Western Mountains ecoregion, where we found that just over 65% of the water bodies in that ecoregion were functioning as nitrous oxide sinks. So while we have some evidence of geographic variation in the extent of nitrous oxide undersaturation within each of these ecoregions, um, what I think really is much more striking is actually the, the similarity between these ecoregions. <clears throat> so we have a range of values um, that are relatively restricted. Um, regardless of what ecoregion you're in, somewhere between 60 and 80% of all the water bodies in that particular ecoregion were functioning as a nitrous oxide sink. When we scale these estimates, or we scale these measurements to estimates of the magnitude of nitrous oxide emissions or consumption uh, by each water body, an upscale to the United States, um, we actually find that the magnitude of the emissions is positive. Um, Cumulatively, lakes and reservoirs in the U.S. are functioning as a source of nitrous oxide, but it's really quite a small source, particularly when you compare it to other known anthropogenic nitrous oxide sources in the United States. I'm calling into question this long-standing paradigm that fresh waters um, are a globally significant source of nitrous oxide to the atmosphere. Another indicator that we looked at is the dissolved methane concentration. Uh, so methane is another potent greenhouse gas that's accumulating in the atmosphere. So here we got a bit of a different story relative to that of nitrous oxide. Every single water body that we sampled with only one exception was super saturated with methane. In other words, these water bodies are emitting methane uh, to the atmosphere. And the range of concentrations that we observed is really quite broad, spanning at least four orders of magnitude across the 2017 NLA water bodies. So here we're looking at the mean in 95% confidence interval, the mean dissolved methane concentration uh, for the population of water bodies when, within each of the nine main ecoregions. Uh, so despite having dissolved methane concentrations that uh, span four orders of magnitude, we have relatively little evidence for systematic uh, spatial variability um, across these nine ecoregions. Uh, the Southern Plains has the highest average dissolved methane concentration um, but also has very broad 95% confidence intervals. Um, the Northern Plains ecoregion has the lowest mean estimate um, and is also the most constrained. Um, so we do have a statistically significant difference between the Northern Plains and, and Southern Plains, 
but overall, a lot of overlap in dissolved methane concentrations among these ecoregions. We found that dissolved methane concentration was related to a number of different environmental variables. Uh, for example, dissolved methane concentrations are smaller in water bodies that have large watershed areas. Uh, dissolved methane was low in large lakes and low in deep lakes. Dissolved methane concentration was also sensitive to temperature, um, where there are higher in warm water bodies and higher in, in, in water bodies that were located in the southern portion of the United States and also sensitive to water chemistry, specifically sulfate. So high sulfate lakes had lower methane, um, had lower methane concentrations. So large, cold, and deep lakes, particularly those that had been abundant sulfite, um, had the lowest methane concentrations. There's a number of different mechanisms by which methane that's produced in the lake can escape to the atmosphere. The NLA sampling allowed us to estimate diffusive emissions, this emission component here, um, but it did not capture ebullition, which is uh, the release of methane containing bubbles from sediment to the atmosphere. So we designed a, a follow-up project to investigate the magnitude of this uh, bubbling emission in um, NLA 2017 water bodies. In this follow-up study, we teamed up with, uh, um, with Region 10 biologists and we revisited eight of the 2017 National Lakes Assessment reservoirs that were sampled in Region 10. In each of these eight water bodies, we sampled anywhere between 15 and 20 sampling locations, and so not just the index site. Um, and we used some different methods. We used floating chambers that allowed us to directly measure uh, diffusive emissions. And we deployed these inverted funnels in each water body, which allowed us to estimate the magnitude of methane that was being released to the atmosphere from bubbles that were rising through the water column. Uh, we found that uh, across these eight water bodies, greater than 70% of the total amount of methane that was being released from the lakes was actually from bubbling as opposed to diffusive emissions, um, indicating that in order to accurately estimate the magnitude of methane emissions from U.S. lakes and reservoirs, um, we really need to be able to uh, quantify this bubbling component of the flux. So that finding led to the establishment of the SURGE project, Survey of Reservoir Greenhouse Gas Emissions. In this project, we're revisiting 108 of the man-made uh, systems that were sampled in the 2017 National Lakes Assessment. Each of these 108 water bodies were measuring both bubbles and diffusive flux, and we're doing so at anywhere from 15 to 25 locations within each water body. Uh, this is a, a four-year project, so we're about halfway through, and uh, field work is being uh, mobilized out of seven different laboratories. And this is a collaboration between ORD, um, Region 10, the USGS, as well as the Department of Energy. So the objective of this work is to improve our estimate of the magnitude of greenhouse gas emissions from US uh, reservoirs. Um, those estimates will be included in the annual inventory of greenhouse gas emissions in sinks that the EPA, um, that the EPA publishes. The current report covering 1990 to 2020 is currently up for public review and this is the very first report where uh, we've actually included uh, surface waters as a greenhouse gas source. Um, the emission estimates included in, the, in this report do not utilize the surge or the NLA data, um, rather they use um, data that's currently available in the literature. Um, but the idea is when the surge project is done, we'll come and we'll update these estimates using, um, uh, using the, the field data generated here in the US. Um, of, Potentially particular interest to our stakeholders is within this report, I've broken down all the emission estimates by state. So if you're interested to see what the magnitude of emissions is from any particular state or how those emissions break down between large reservoirs and small reservoirs, et cetera, um, see the report. There's, there's lots of detail that can be found in there. Uh, so in conclusion, a couple um, important findings. So one is that most lakes function as N2O sinks during the summer. Um, and that the U.S. lakes are a relatively small source of nitrous oxide during the summer months. Uh, by contrast, nearly all U.S. lakes are emitting methane to the atmosphere during the summer, and that the concentration of methane dissolved in water bodies can be predicted from variables related to conditions of the watershed, uh, the morphology of the reservoir itself, climate, um, as well as water chemistry. So in terms of next steps, um, we will be completing the 2022 and 2023 sampling seasons for the surge project. And as I indicated earlier, we'll then revisit the greenhouse gas inventory report and update uh, those estimates using the surge and NLA data. Wonderful.
Thanks a lot, Jake. That was uh, that was really interesting, and it's exciting to see just how much uh, uh, the NARS program and 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 the agencies and and partners are are doing to do what you're doing right here, which is expanding our knowledge of what's going on in our water bodies and our understanding. Uh, I've got some questions. I've got one question anyway right now to start with, um, and I encourage other folks to go in the chat and drop a drop a question in. Uh, folks are muted, but um, but chat is free. Um, so uh, Kathleen Wozniak asks, can we get a copy of the reservoir greenhouse gas site list? Um, yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm happy to share that. And unfortunately, I don't have that available um, you know, on an EPA website or anything along those lines. So it kind of has to be disseminated on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, so anybody who's interested in that, in that list, um, please contact me and I'd be happy to happy to share it. All right, do we have any other questions? Okay, maybe we'll, um, we'll also make some, whoops, here we go. One from Sarah Lehman. Given the predictive model, could you look at potential changes for changes in climate? Yeah, presumably we could, um, we, we could do that. Um, right now, the predictive model, the predictive model includes temperature, you know, as one of the important predictors. So if we had information on how we anticipate water temperature in these water bodies to change, um, we could then make some estimates about how methane emissions might change. Um, we also have uh, um, a couple different, two different published models um, using different data sets um, where we've shown that one of the most important predictors of methane emissions from lakes and reservoirs, um, even more important than temperature, is um, al algae abundance. Um, so the greener these waters are, the more methane um, that they're producing. Um, so I'm actually working on a project with um, NCEE, the National Center for Environmental Economics, our EPA um, colleagues in Washington, D.C., where we're thinking about um, what reductions in nutrient loadings to water bodies might yield in terms of reduced greenness, so reducing algae blooms, and then what we might realize in terms of reduced greenhouse gas emissions from those water bodies. I'm trying to quantify that reduction in greenhouse gases and monetize it using social cost of carbon and uh, quantifying that as a, a co-benefit of any um, you know, water quality trading or nutrient reduction efforts that were, that were put in place. So we've thought quite a bit about linking nutrients, algae, and, and methane. Um, certainly the mechanisms are there to make that link with temperature as well in a climate change context, um, but I haven't gone very far down that road yet. Great. Thank you. That's a that's a lot of really interesting work. We've got a a, a final question um, from Catherine Hine, and uh, where she says, "Interesting results. I'm not surprised that lakes uh, were methane sources, given what I've seen elsewhere. But this is a huge sample size." She asks, "Were you surprised by the uh, the N2O, the nitrous oxide?" Oh yeah, I was. Yeah, likewise. So. I wasn't real surprised by the methane, but it never been demonstrated on quite this scale before. But the nitrous oxide, yeah, I was very surprised. Um, most of my dish, I've been working on nitrous oxide emissions from aquatic systems for quite a while, though mostly in flowing waters where nitrous oxide emissions are typically pretty well tied to nitrate concentrations. And flowing waters are almost always found to be a source of nitrous oxide when the measurements are made. Um, so to see nearly three quarters of the of the nation's water bodies function as N2O sinks during the summer, um, yeah, I was very surprised. I remain very surprised, even though I've had these results for <laughs> 40 years now. That is really neat. That's, I guess it's got to be really fun, the, uh, the, that, that discovery. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the best part about doing science, right, is you, you're you identify an interesting question, you do so much work to get the data, get the numbers and you write the code. And it's like that moment when you hit the, the enter button and you finally get to visualize that figure. That's, wow, it was, it was a great moment. <laughs> that is really cool. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the, the presentation and, uh, and the answers that you're providing. Um, we're gonna go to our next uh, presentation. Uh, research biologist Eric Pilgrim, uh, who works in EPA's National Exposure Research Laboratory, where he develops molecular DNA methods for bioassessment.
environmental monitoring, and the detection of aquatic invasive species. So he's currently leading the development of DNA barcoding and next generation DNA sequencing for bio biological monitoring programs like NARS. So here is, uh, here is his insight into eDNA. Hello everyone, I am Eric Pilgrim with EPA ORD in Cincinnati, and I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of our NARS related po projects, specifically DNA metabarcoding diatoms and bacteria from paraphyton from the 2018-19 nurses samples. So to make sure we're all uh, coming from the same standpoint, I wanna give some background on DNA barcoding and DNA metabarcoding. So DNA barcoding has been around for about 20 years. It is the idea that you can use a specific piece of DNA, sequences from that specific piece of DNA to identify organisms to species. For animals, it happens to be a mitochondrial gene called CO1. Uh, and so here's a layout of how it works. You have an unknown mayfly larvae, you get the barcode sequence, you compare that barcode sequence to the library of barcode reference sequences that are out there from curated uh, morphologically ID'd specimens, and then you get an ID for your unknown. DNA metabarcoding is expanding that to a mixed sample. So in this case, it is a paraphyton sample that's a mixture of a bunch of different biotic, uh, biotic communities. We extract the DNA from it all at once we do PCR for the barcode locus and do next generation sequencing, a different kind of sequencing that creates millions of sequences for the samples. And then we go through some bioinformatics and come up with a list of uh, members of that community within the paraphyton. So the way this has worked for the uh, National Rivers and Streams Assessment uh, involved taking a subsample from the normal paraphyton sample uh, we've tried to make it the least a bit of work possible for the crews. So we just asked to get about 100 milliliters of the sample that they would normally have discarded. Uh, then it was frozen and stored frozen, shipped to EPA Cincinnati frozen, where we then thawed it, filtered it, did our DNA extractions. Then we took the extracted DNA and did our barcoding PCR. For diatoms, this is a gene called RBCL. It's a chloroplast gene. For bacteria, it is 16S. And then those went on to the instrument, the MySeq for metabarcoding sequencing. And then we ran some bioinformatics on the, on the output. So uh, I can't actually give you a lot of information on the results right now because we're doing lots of different analyses, but uh, just to show the, from the 2000 plus samples for the diatoms, we ended up with over 4,000 operational taxonomic units. And we think of those as being analogous to species that's from 37 million DNA sequences. And for the bacterial 16S, we ended up with over 13,000 OTUs from about, about 27 million sequences. And the reason I say analyses are ongoing is because we're looking at them from a lot of different ways. And as we start to look at them more, it raises more questions and leads to more analyses. So uh, we're working with OW and, and some other folks in EPA Cincinnati, and we're gonna, it's a really interesting data set. So it presents a lot of opportunities. But I wanna talk about one of the kinds of studies that we've done on a smaller scale that we're looking to apply to the national data set. So uh, we had a nutrient indicator study that we did in a, water, in a local watershed that we go to whenever we wanna do studies uh, locally within a watershed. And this is the little Miami watershed. We've heavily studied it here at the EPA for decades now. And we chose 25 sites within the watershed that represent a gradient of nutrient condition for both phosphorus and nitrogen. They were sampled weekly from July through October. So that was about, led to about 14 samples per site. We also collected uh, phosphorus and nitrogen chemistry from those samples. And we sampled the paraphyton each week and then brought those back to the lab, extracted DNA and did metabarcoding. And then those metabarcoding results went through some other analyses, including Titan, which is a threshold indicator taxa analysis, boosted regression trees and gradient forest analysis. 
And some of the output from those uh, analyses leads to these cool figures uh, here where you can see Titan uh, pools indicators into low uh, or high responders. And so you get diatom OTUs that are responding to low phosphorus conditions and diatoms that are responding to high phosphorus conditions. And so the figure on the left, you can see a couple of different peaks. The, the low P diatoms are responding at lower concentrations. And then the figure uh, to the right of that is just the, the gradient uh, that each OTU is responding to. And then the same is true uh, for nitrogen, although the results are somewhat different. We see some sort of uh, smoothed out peaks. The, the response isn't as strong for nitrogen and diatoms as it is for phosphorus. And then also for bacteria, we see some similar results. We see a nice uh, strong peak at, at, a constant, at a low concentration for uh, low P bacteria responders, and, uh, and then a broader peak, uh, broader curve for bacteria that are responding to high phosphorus conditions. And then we do see a distinct response to low nitrogen and high nitrogen in the bacterial OTUs. So when we combine the boosted regression analysis with the Titan analysis with gradient forest analysis, we see a lot of thresholds uh, come up where there are re responses at for low P and high P and low N and a high N OTUs. And when you can combine this all together, it leads to some points, some thresholds where we see changes in the community. And so this is just at the watershed level. We see similar responses in the diatoms and the bacteria within this watershed. It's not a guarantee that the bacteria are responding to the nutrients. They could be responding to changes in the diatom community. But still, overall, these are numbers that can be used as targets for a watershed or at a broader scale. And so looking at this at the watershed level, these are the kinds of things that we want to apply to the national data set, either at regional or full national levels, and see what sort of information and uh, thresholds we come up with. And then I want to switch gears here and talk about work that we're doing for the National Lakes Assessment. This is very different. We are looking at fish eDNA, because currently, as part of the National Lake Assessment, there's no fish community analysis of these lakes that are sampled. So uh, eDNA is any kind of DNA that is shred, shed from the organism during uh, any sort of biological process, feeding, uh, excreting, being eaten, respiring, just swimming around, sloughing uh, cells into the environment. Fish provide a lot of environmental DNA, more so than some other species that occur in the aquatic environment. And so you can extract that DNA from water and then apply metabarcoding to those samples in an effort to determine which fish are present in the lake. Now, it's not so simple as just one sample gives us all of the fish that occur in the lake. Uh, eDNA is patchy uh, and not evenly distributed uh, throughout the, the lake uh, from the different species. So we are employing this oversampling strategy where we're trying to figure out what is the best sampling method. So right now, there's been a lot of work with EPA Duluth, uh, looking at nine lakes in Minnesota. And we have something like a thousand samples, eDNA samples from those lakes. We're looking at different depth contours, uh, inlets and outlets and boat ramps. Uh, we looked at the, the, the lakes fit into three different size classes. So we're trying to um, overkill in terms of the sampling to get a sense of just how many samples are needed, what kinds of samples are needed to give you the best chance of capturing as much of the community uh, with the eDNA from the least number of samples, so the least number of work. And with that, I want to say there's lots and lots of people that are helping out with this work. OW has been uh, very instrumental in helping with any of these samples even being taken. Uh, Lester Yuan at OW is uh, amazing in terms of doing statistical analysis and crunching numbers and coming up with new ways of looking at things. 
all of the state partners and GLEC have been uh, instrumental in getting us the samples, getting us good quality samples. There's a variety of folks at EPA Cincinnati that are helping with the lab work and sample design, and EPA Duluth has been a huge help in collecting all of these lake samples and upcoming lake samples. And with that, I will end and hopefully take some questions. Thank you, Eric. That was uh, that was fascinating, and it's just great to see what happens when when those samples and all the uh, the requests for you know um, new kinds of parameters. Uh, uh, contribute to uh, to this this expansion of knowledge. All right, do we have any questions for Eric? Uh, please do put them in the chat. My apologies for anybody that had uh, audio difficulties. Yeah, we're going to work on that. And when we put together the the video um, that we'll post on our YouTube channel, we'll um, we'll try to work on the the audio. Uh, uh, the source audio may be better than what we're hearing through the program today. So. We'll be we'll be working on that. Okay, so we have a question from Kathy Wozniak. Is there an estimated report date for the parafitin data? It sounds really exciting. Um, at least in the next year to two years. I mean, right now we're we're uh, we've just recently gotten the national nutrients data to uh, start crunching with the kinds of Titan analysis that so uh, that we'll do so. Uh, Nate Smucker, my co-author, is starting to work on that. So hopefully we'll have some some answers on that in the next six months to a year. I don't know when we'll have uh, an actual report, but um, anybody that's interested certainly can reach out to me and I'll let you know. Great. Thank you. Here's here's one from uh, Jay Silvanimia. Uh, Silvanima. Sorry about that. Uh, can you speak to the confounding factors such as extraneous inputs of DNA from avian predators, et cetera, dropping DNAs into water bodies. So had to ask, he says. Yeah, that's possible. Um, so it's certainly the question will be how many times a species shows up uh, in, in the number of samples. So if a species maybe only shows up in one sample out of say 30 taken for a lake, then you know we might have it, it might not be considered clearly a member of that community and would probably take more work. But um, so you would think that that wouldn't be as common for, say, bird poop. As opposed to the, the new newly uh, discovered Lake Osprey or underwater Lake Osprey. Yes. Um, OK, here's one uh, How did, from Brene Brooks. How dynamic is the DNA to other parameters such as stream flow volume? Uh, is that in reference to the diatom, the paraphyton, or things like fishy DNA? The diatom and the paraphyton. Um, we that's certainly something I think that Lester will want to uh, to look at. Um, I, I can't say much about that myself. That's not my area of expertise. But um, you know, this is. Being paraphyton, it's it's a little different than just say sampling the diatoms that are present in the water column, which we've considered doing as a comparison. But uh, the, the paraphyton is already part of the regular collection that the field crews do, so that's we just thought it was easier to piggyback off that. Great. Okay. Um, we've got two more, and then we're gonna uh, cut this off and and try to address the, any of the rest at the uh, at the end. So one from Kathy Wozniak, are you able to look for the toxin genes for cyanobacteria? Yes, we would be able to do that. That's not been our focus, but there's some other folks in Cincinnati that do that work. Uh, Jing Rang and uh, um, Jorge Santo Domingo have been interested in uh, HABs. So uh, certainly wouldn't have a problem with sharing uh, the DNA with them if that's something they wanna investigate. Sure, there's going to be a lot of interest in that. Okay, last question for this program or for this this uh, presentation, and that's from Robert Smith. Do you see a possible application for barcoding or meta barcoding for bacteria source tracking? Could we use this tool to find bacteria like E. coli or Enterococci sources in rivers, lakes, etc.? Yes, and there's uh, some work. Uh, Rich Hoagland's group already does some of this kind of work with the nurse's samples. 
So I'm not sure if it rises to the level of source tracking because the, the sort of the, the sampling scheme that is created by NARS because it's not extensive within a watershed, but um, it certainly could point to places where that kind of work should be done. All right, and then um, uh, for for more on bird poop and process, um, I'm going to direct folks to the chat because there's an interesting uh, comment from Chelsea Hatzenbuehler uh, about uh, fish eDNA and bird poop. So um, have we look? And in the meantime, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, queuing up the next presentation. And this is by uh, Troy Langknecht of Rhode Island. Um, she's putting some of these eDNA tools to work on a project examining the effects of nanoplastics on bed thick communities. She's an ORISE uh, scientist who's also leading two uh, microplastics projects, including the one she'll be presenting today. That's a pilot study of microplastic contamination in marine sediments off the coasts of Maine and New Hampshire. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna roll uh, Troy's presentation and then we'll have questions at the end. Hi everyone, my name is Troy Lingnett. I am an All Rise Research Participant with the US EPA's Atlantic Coastal Environmental Sciences Division in Narragansett, Rhode Island. And today I'll be sharing progress on the NCCA pilot study looking at microplastics contamination in marine sediments off the coast of Maine and New Hampshire. To start off with some background, uh, microplastics are plastic pieces less than five millimeters and are ubiquitous in marine environments. And they eventually settle into benthic sediments where they may have various negative impacts on marine organisms, such as internal blockage, entanglement, and exposure to hazardous chemicals, although there are other impacts that are still being researched at this time. Therefore, quantification and identification are really important to better understand potential impacts and to identify areas for further research. However, these processes are really time and cost intensive. And there's little research available investigating relationships between microplastic and abundance and sediment characteristics and measurements that could act as possible indicators and therefore forego these time intensive quantification or identification procedures. Um, there have been a couple of studies to indicate that small grain size may be an indicator, but again, there is very little research on this topic. And so we decided to conduct this pilot study to determine if regular monitoring through the National Coastal Conditioning Assessment on microplastics was feasible. So our objectives were to quantify and identify microplastic particles between 45 and 1,000 microns in coastal sediments using a novel extraction method and Raman spectroscopy. And we also wanted to look at whether um, microplastic abundance among sites of varying degrees of human disturbance were different and to conduct exploratory analyses correlating abundance with sediment characteristics and measurements. So moving into our methods. The National Coastal Conditioning Assessment collected 51 samples off the coast of Maine and New Hampshire in 2020. And because these processes are so time intensive to analyze microplastics, we just selected 10 of those sites. And we did so by prioritizing areas of higher human development and harbors. So we chose the Casco Bay area of Maine, the Great Bay area of New Hampshire, and Hampton Beach also in New Hampshire. And the great thing about working with NCCA is they also are doing analysis on many other different sediment measures, such as toxicity, benthic diversity, and con chemical contamination. And while the 2020 data is not complete yet, we do have access to the 2015 data for these sample, sample locations. So we extracted the microplastics from the sediment using a hybrid method. And this method first separates the sediment into two particle size classes. And then using separatory funnels and sodium bromide, we conduct two density separations. Following extraction, we identify the microplastic particles using Raman spectroscopy, picking the large particles from the larger size class and analyzing them individually. And then we scanned the smaller size class filter 12.5% of it and extrapolated that data. So moving into our results, the mean across all 10 sites was 165 microplastic particles per 100 grams of wet sediment, 
And we did buy microplastics at all 10 sites, so you can see that the number varied quite a bit across all 10 sites. Um, so the orange line here is the mean, and the site with the least amount of microplastics was site 12, um, sort of out in open water in Casco Bay, and then the site with highest contamination was site 17, also in Casco Bay. Um, and so this, these northern sites in Casco Bay, 17, um, 11, and 27, all had relatively high abundance compared to the other sites. And we're sort of still investigating why that might be. There are several marinas in the area, fishing areas. Um, and they're all sort of at the mouth of that smaller bay. So those could be contributing factors to the higher microplastic abundance. The other site with considerably high abundance compared to the other sites was site 38, which is right off the coast of Hampton Beach in New Hampshire. And so we really weren't surprised about that level of contamination as Hampton Beach does get a really high a number of tourists every summer and there is really high human disturbance because of that. So we found 15 polymers across all 10 sites and this chart is organized in descending order. So polypropylene was the most abundant followed by polyamide, styrenisoprene, polyethylene, et cetera, with silicone being the least abundant. And all 15 of these polymers are commonly used in commercial and industrial applications. And so we really weren't surprised to see this group of polymers present across 10 sites. We were surprised at such high abundance of polyamide being the second most common. We haven't really seen that in the other studies that we looked at in preparation for this study. And so we started to do a little bit of digging and found that polyamide is also known as nylon and is used quite often in boating and fishing nets, ropes, and lines. And so our first thought was that these sites might be in really close proximity to boating and fishing areas and getting contamination through um, their supplies. Um, but we also did have air blanks on the boats while the samples were being collected. And once we analyzed those, analyzed those samples, we found that the collection blanks did have very high levels of polyamide with an average of 41 polyamide pieces per blank. And so we started to wonder whether the high contamination in from the samples was actually coming from exposure while um, the samples were being collected on the boats. And so we subtracted the number of, the average number of polyamide pieces in the blank from all of our samples. And this is the result. So on the left, we have the chart that shows the original levels of abundance for each polymer, which we saw in the previous slide, and on the right is with polyamide subtracted, the average of 41. And so you can see polyamide in the light green is now only prevalent in two sites, and it moved from the second most abundant to the sixth most abundant. And so this really tells us how important blanks are when conducting microplastics analysis. Um, we know that humans are contributing to microplastic contamination in the environment, and that does include activities um, like sample collection and things that we do while we're analyzing the samples. And so having blanks allows us to understand what the um, environmental contamination levels were before we got to those sites. Um, and so blanks are really important. And we think that this chart on the right is probably a more representative um, abundance of polymers in the environment. Just to quickly talk through the characteristics of the particles we found, about half of the microplastic particles were fragments um, and fibers were the second most abundant shape, although there is a chance that fibers are underestimated as because of their shape, they do tend to slip through sieves quite easily. And then moving into the size, the majority of the microplastic pieces were less than 250 microns. And this has been noted in many other studies and does present some concerns for health impacts. Um, the smaller the particle, the more different channels and pathways they could take to enter um, human bodies or different organisms in the environment. And then for color, we found that the white, gray, silver, clear, and black, dark particles were more abundant. And we did look at the shape by polymer type, and we found that they did, a lot of the polymers did have sort of a characteristic shape that they um, appeared in the environment. So acrylic, polyamide, polyester, and polyethylene terephthalate were all mostly fibers, which of course these are used um, as nylon or in the textile industry. Others 
were more often found as fragments such as PVC, silicone, um, styrene isoprene, and Teflon. Um, and then there were a couple that were pretty widespread, so polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. And this isn't really surprising because those are very commonly used polymers and they're used for a host of different applications. And so it's not surprising that they're showing up in different forms in the environment. And finally, to discuss the correlation with sediment measures, we did find a correlation with nine of the 10 sites with total PAHs. Um, and we think this is likely due to the proximity, proximity of similar sources. So both PAHs and microplastics um, could be coming from things like roads or marinas, um, or we think it's because of similar behavior in fine sediment. We did not find relationships with other variables, such as total organic carbon, brain size, metals, or benthic survival. And we were a little bit surprised to see this because some other studies have found that small grain size and total organic carbon have been correlated with sediments and our data did not show that. We are looking to do some future analysis, um, looking at correlation with proximity to anthropogenic sources, such as wastewater treatment plants, boat yards and marinas and recreational areas. So just to summarize, um, we did find microplastics at all 10 sites, and these levels were similar to other coastal and estuarine sites. Um, we did find that and reiterate that blanks are really important to identifying possible contamination, and smaller microplastics are more abundant than larger microplastics, which could have potential negative health implications for humans and marine organisms. We did find a correlation with total PAHs, and that could provide a site prioritization for researchers. Um, but we'd like to do some future analyses looking at relationships with proximity to anthropogenic sources. And with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Troy. That's, uh, that's sobering stuff. Um, and as a layperson, it's really exciting to see the, the the logic and process that goes into scientific method it's just uh it's it's a really neat uh neat phenomenon to observe um we have our first question for you uh from matthew lyman who asks have you looked at circulation patterns within casco bay and if they may relate to the higher concentration at station 17. yeah so far we haven't looked into the circulation patterns but i do know some other studies have looked into things like that and um, like deposition as well. So that may be something that we look at as we continue to consider different elements that are influencing microplastic abundance at these sites. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm gonna watch the chat box. And at this point too, I'm going to continue or once again, apologize to the speakers for the audio issue that we've found ourselves in. And um, so Sue and Callie are working on a fix to that. And uh, again, when we put this up um, on video, we will make sure that we've got the original source audio. But in the meantime, in the next couple of minutes, hopefully we'll be able to fix whatever's bedeviling the, uh, the audio. But, but we really apologize to the speakers who have put a lot of time into to sharing these programs with us. Uh, Sarah has a question for you, Troy. Do you know if there are any uh, consensus growing uh, related to monitoring or lab methods? Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. There are no standardized methods at this time, either for sample collecting, um, extraction, identification. Um, but I think the community of microplastic researchers as a whole, it definitely works together. It's a very collaborative field right now. Um, so I think we are moving in the right direction. Um, there was a very large intercalibration study conducted by the Southern California Coastal Water Research, Research Project, <laughs> SQRP, um, in California. And they did a really large study with 40 labs to try to standardize methods. Um, and that was part of a microplastics mandate by the state of California. So I think we are moving in the right direction, but there's definitely still a lot of work to be done in that area. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, certainly gonna be a uh, information in high demand. Do we have any other questions? 
All right, I understand we are ready to try plan B or C on audio. So again, apologies uh, to Jake and Eric and Troy uh, for, for the audio issues um, and to all, all who are listening, but uh, we're gonna try uh, a new plan for the next one. And that one's gonna be from Mary Nord. Uh, Mary Nord is a life scientist with EPA's Region 5 uh, Water Division in Chicago, who's helped develop ambient background threshold values for sediment quality in lakes around the contiguous US. Today, she'll be presenting some of her insight on sediment contamination in lakes. So we're gonna roll that and uh, hope that we've got good audio. Hi, my name is Mari Nord with the US EPA Region 5 office, and I'll be going over the results of one of the 2017 National Lake Assessment Research Indicators, sediment quality. The study proposal was based on the work that Minnesota Pollution Control Agency had completed back in 2007 as an enhancement to their NLA work by conducting a statewide sediment survey that was led by Dr. Judy Crane. We propose sediments because sediment quality can help us better understand historic, ongoing, and potential stress to the ecosystem as contaminants move through the water, accumulate in sediment, and bioaccumulate and biomagnify through the food chain. The study goal was to assess the overall condition of surficial sediment quality nationally. And we do this by having collected sediment and by use of an integrative tool to represent the mixture of contaminants to assess the data, which we'll be talking about today. On this slide, you can see that a modified KB core was used. It's pictured on the far left. We extruded the sediment sample, collecting just the top five centimeters, and we sometimes had to send the core down a couple times and composited those samples to get the necessary volume to analyze for metals, metalloids, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PCBs, legacy pesticides, grain size, and total organic carbon. This was all collected either in the deepest or near the center of a lake. For this study, we focused on the 1,005 probabilistic sites that were sampled on visit one. Of these, 969 sites were included in our analysis. We don't have data for some of the sites because the sediment was either too soft or too hard, and also there were 19 sites in Oregon that we did not get the results for in time to include in the study. Still, we had a completeness of 98%, which kind of demonstrated to us the feasibility of using sediment as a possible indicator in the future. As part of the analysis, we looked at the data and found some interesting patterns. One of the patterns that we looked at was in total organic carbon. In the bottom right graph, you'll see um, samples with high percent total organic carbon and high percent moisture, making some of the sampling at those sites a little bit more challenging. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, in the photos top left, that was taken immediately after pulling the core up. And after waiting 10 or so minutes, you can see kind of that material had settled a little bit more, but it took that long um, in the top right photo. You can see that this pattern is mostly found with these high total organic levels in the Northwest, Midwest, and Northeast. For this study, we decided to use the consensus-based sediment quality guidelines derived by McDonald and others. For these guidelines, they have two benchmarks, the threshold effects concentration and the probable effect concentration. The values below the TEC are considered to be protective of benthic health, and those above the PEC will likely have detrimental effects to the benthic health. We then decided to generate box plots and compare them against PEC and TEC values. Metals such as copper are common and occur naturally and are essential to life at the right concentrations, but in excess may be toxic. So anthropogenic activities such as the application of copper algicides, degradation of treated wood, pesticide use, and mining activities can all increase the amount of copper found in sediments. And as we all know, the, there are some natural sources as well, so which is why with metals, we think it is um, always worth exploring it a little bit further. <laughs> 
kind of along those lines, we, we decided to use heat maps to, um, shown on the left side of the slide here, um, where the red represents levels that exceed the PEC values. These heat maps helped us see what was driving the mean PEC quotient, which I'll describe in a few more slides. But note the link between the map of nickel on the right side and the elevated levels um, that appear in that Northern California area, area of the Zurich region. As part of exploring the data, we decided to look at metal results alongside the USGS soil maps to see if there were any similar patterns in distribution. The USGS soil map on the left is of course at a different scale and concentration display than the thresholds we used um, on the map on the right. Um, but what we saw was that in some situations like that of nickel, and you can see it there in Northern California um, that I highlighted from our last slide and on this map here too, um, it aligns with a similar pattern that we saw um, for nickel concentrations in the soils. This helped kind of reinforce the idea that some metals such as nickel may be attributed to natural conditions or at least present in the area due to historic activity. This is a box plot of total PAHs by ecoregion. Um, we summed up 13 priority PAHs to calculate our total PAH, um, and if there were any non-detects, we used half of their reporting limit. While we looked at the individual PAHs, I'm sharing today the total PAH graph because in calculating condition assessment, um, we look at total PAHs, they're usually found in mixtures. And as you may know, we study pHs because they're hydrophobic and tend to settle out of water and accumulate in sediments and have a toxic effect and can bioaccumulate. Some examples of anthropogenic sources include coal tar applications, car exhaust, and power plants. But there are also some natural resources such as forests and brush fires. What we see here in this graph are some outliers above the PEC value. And while there may be some as a result of natural, resource, natural sources, uh, we believe that the influence of anthropogenic activities is likely to be greater. And I think that our next slide will show you kind of why we came to that conclusion. We also decided to explore the results in the context of land use around the lake. Um, we explored the effect of both, both kind of the watershed level and the catchment level where we define the watershed as a hydrologically connected catchment in Lake Cat and the catchment level, which are defined by the Huck 8. Um, but because we didn't see significant difference between the results, we decided to focus the rest of the analyses on watersheds. Um, the land use was pulled from the 2016 National Land Cover Database, where we categorize the covers into seven major categories that you see here. The categories are defined really by the major use within the wa that watershed. And here we compared land use with total pHs here in this graph here. And you can see kind of where there's a higher incidence of contamination and sediments in the developed watersheds category. Again, kind of noting patterns, it's not necessarily too surprising, um, but this is uh, some of the additional data exploration we did. This is a table with results from a Spearman rank order correlation analysis done using R. In the red circle, you can see the correlation coefficient for total pHs to percent developed land use. Um, kind of another way of showing the information that I shared in the last slide. What we also see is some interesting patterns. For instance, on the far right in blue, the results indicate that there is a positive correlation between contaminants and deeper lakes. Essentially, that we would be likely to find higher contamination in deeper lakes. We also see a negative correlation between contaminants and elevation, indicating that we found elevated contaminant levels in lower elevation lakes. A lack of pattern that we took note of as well is, the highlighted, is highlighted in green next to the blue columns, um, and that's that sediment quality was not strongly associated with lake area or watershed area. While the thresholds for the different parameters were great to help analyze the data, 
To assess sediment quality at a broad national scale, we decided to calculate the mean PEC quotient. The mean PEC quotient is an integrative tool that looks at a mixture of contaminants along a unitless index. The mixture that we looked at for this study included seven metals and metalloids and total PAHs, which um, as I mentioned earlier, consisted of 13 PAHs. We decided not to include the legacy pesticides or PCBs because of their high number of non-detects. But for those parameters um, within this calculation, uh, where, there was, where there was a couple that had non-detects, we did replace them with half of the reporting limit. And some may notice also that this is a really similar approach to the assessment um, that we use for the National Coastal Condition Assessment in the Great Lakes. Once we calculated the quotients, um, we, we decided that it needed to align with the NARS system of kind of good, fair, poor categories. So we decided to set benchmarks that corresponded to the likelihood of adverse effects to the benthic community. The benchmark for poor to fair corresponded to a 50% incidence of toxicity and for fair to good, a 10% incidence of toxicity using a 28-day Hyalella survival test um, as presented in, other research, um, in research papers by Ingersoll and others. Here we're excited to share the first ever national scale sediment quality assessment condition. The graph on the left shows our findings that include site weights so that we can provide results as both point estimates and um, with a 95% confidence interval for the respective categories. At the bottom of the graph, uh, you'll just note the not assessed in gray. That's um, a result of what I had mentioned earlier. A few of the sites weren't sampled, and then we didn't have the results for a small percent. Um, but the large percent of lakes that are, are categorized as fair, which is in the color yellow, this is actually not that surprising. Um, because in addition to anthropogenic activities, there might be some elevated le levels due to ambient natural conditions and possible atmospheric sources. Um, we do see a low percent in poor, and as many of you know, um, this isn't surprising either because a lot of times when we hear of sediment studies, they're usually conducted specifically at contaminated sites. Um, whereas this is kind of the first study where it's a probabilistic design and randomly selected. So it kind of provides us with more context. Um, the two graphs on the right show the breakdown by ecoregions. The top shows the lakes that are categorized in good condition, and the bottom is that of poor condition. While nationally there aren't many lakes categorized in poor condition, um, you may notice that in that Zurich region it shows a higher point estimate and a large confidence interval. Um, again, uh, if you think back to a few slides earlier, um, we want to have you keep in mind um, our findings for like nickel. Um, so in that context, we do recommend exploring any additional information when reviewing these results to help with additional context. Um, but overall, we, we felt like this was a good first assessment and a step toward exploring sediment as an indicator to help us better understand the health of our water bodies and managing them. And while I gave this talk today, it is really Michelle Mayer, Judy Crane, and Alex Biak that did the work so that I could share this information. We also want to thank all the field crews for collecting the samples, the labs for analyzing it, the steering committee for approving the study, and the overall NARS team for making it all come together. And to Amina Pollard, was the NLA lead at the time for supporting the study and for providing technical input as well as asking tough questions throughout the process. Lorena, the current lead for her continued support, and Sarah Lehman, who is always behind the scenes helping out in countless ways. And without the sediment work group, this would not be possible. They shared their expertise and provided recommendations before, during, and after the samples were collected and through the analysis. And with that, I want to thank you for the time you took to listen to this presentation. Um, I've included both myself and Michelle's contact information here. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments or actually even suggestions on how we can maybe continue to improve this as a potential indicator for the National Lakes Assessment. Thank you.
Thank you. And I, I know that was another uh, uh, particularly tough audio situation, um, but uh, I, I hope uh, folks got uh, a really uh, got a chance to listen to that. There was an awful lot of good information and really need to see the way that um, you know, different levels of data and different uh, different overlays of data might be able to come together and, and where the correlations may exist. So thank you. And uh, again, for the recorded version or the YouTube version, we're going to work on that audio. Um, in the meantime, I do have a uh, question from Kelly Merrill. Mary, did you look at total mercury and compare it to results from an earlier NLA? Um, that's a great Question, Kelly. So I think you're um, thinking of the USGS study that was conducted in previous um, surveys. And we do have um, David Krabbenhoff, who was the um, lead on that as part of the work group, but um, we determined kind of that it wasn't necessarily the best to compare those results. Um, with that said, we are working on um, looking at mercury compared to kind of our land use and um, in the context of it in the PEC values and TEC values as well. But um, it was a combination of also the depth at which we collected it. So we decided not to compare them at this time to the historic data that was collected. Great. All right, we have one more from Sarah. Have you had a chance to look at the individual contaminants or mean PEC related to the NLA biological indicators? Um, we have not <laughs> at this time. We <laughs> guess that's the short answer. We have not. Um, that would be an interesting th thing to explore as well. I guess we can start to do that. Um, I'll be honest with you. I haven't asked this of the um, team that's going to be collecting 2022, but even though it's a different time period, I thought it would be interesting actually to start when they get the results for the fish survey, um, looking at just kind of general patterns from that, um, and then how that looks against what we found in our general pattern from the sediments. I'll say that that was something I'm looking forward to exploring, but yeah, definitely um, something to think about. Uh, I will comment that we did, as we came up with the design, as you call, like we are collecting the sediment samples in the center of the lake. And a lot of the benthic is co collected the, in the littoral zone. And we did really have that conversation of, do we want to tie it to the benthic? And should we be collecting the sediment samples on that littoral zone? Um, as a group, we discussed that. And a couple of things came up like, well, is it cost prohibitive? Because really you want to align that location along that littoral zone. You, I don't know that we would want to composite it as much. Um, and then uh, the, the idea too is, is that would we find that type of fine sediments that we would need to analyze for the chemicals that we're looking at. So there was a lot of discussion around that. And so I think at that moment, we sort of acknowledge that maybe it would have to be pulled apart. So. It's, uh, it, uh, it's interesting, it's really interesting. All right, we've got one last one from Sarah. Did you did anything in the analysis surprise you so far? Um, I don't know if I would say surprised us um, because we were kind of we based it on a pilot that was done in Minnesota, their statewide study. So we kind of, you know, went into it with some some kind of expectation or kind of knowledge in that sense. Um, and then there's a whole national sediment inventory that's been done. So we've kind of got a sense of what might be out there. But um, we did, I guess for me recently, I was just like, oh yeah. So it, as we look at different, in different efforts that I'm doing, um, a lot of times we're kind of trying to figure out classification of lakes sometimes. And I just thought it was interesting that the watershed size and the lake size didn't seem to have as much of an influence or association with the amount of contaminants. Um, I guess as far as, you know, a lower elevation lake, that sort of made sense to me. And then of course that deeper lake, but um, especially if uh, maybe there's less disturbance to those sediments, especially in that deep area. But um, I think that I was like, oh, lake size didn't matter as much and watershed size didn't seem to matter as much. So I don't know, that was something that 
we weren't necessarily expecting to see, or I don't know that we were looking into it, but um, it was just something that I took note of. That's neat. Thank you. Yeah, layers and layers of information and data and, and process that uh, it will certainly certainly be very busy in the in the years to come. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'd be That's also I just want to throw out there for any folks on the on the call too, if they have any suggestions or thoughts or ways that we can, you know, improve it or any other suggestions on how we might want to still explore the data um, moving forward. Uh, you know, I, I well, we all welcome that. You know, that's something we appreciate. So that's great, and it would be an outstanding outcome of this this conversation from today uh, to you know be able to bring minds together and then get uh, get collaborations to happen and idea sharing. So, thank you, Mary. For the last round, then, or the last the last batch of ideas is going to come from Renee Brooks, who is a research plant physiologist and isotope ecologist at EPA's Pacific Ecological Systems Division Lab at Corvallis, Oregon. In an interview a few years ago, she described ecohydrology as following water molecules through ecosystems, which is gonna give us a clue about her presentation today uh, on using stable isotope indicators to link landscape processes to stressor levels. So we're gonna uh, listen to uh, her presentation and then uh, we'll have some questions at the end and we'll bring it to a close. Thanks. Hi, my name is Renee Brooks, and today I'm going to tell you about some of the stable isotope indicators that we've been doing in association with the National Aquatic Resource Surveys. And first off, I'd like to acknowledge my team and group of people that have been working on this over the years. The National Aquatic Resource Surveys were designed to answer specific questions. First off, what are the proportions of the nation's waters in different ecological conditions? And what might be the causes of poor ecological conditions? What are the stressors that these waters are facing? The NARS surveys currently addresses a large suite of stressors that might be impacting our nation's waters, such as those that are listed here. But there are several gaps in the, in the types of stressors that we're looking at. First off, there is not a hydrologic indicator, uh, particularly looking at lake water balance, which is a very difficult parameter to be able to try and measure in a single visit. Second, nutrients are a problem throughout the surveys, and we have additional questions about what might be the sources and what's causing variation within the nitrogen concentration. These are two areas that we've applied stable isotopes to, to try and develop an indicator. Stable isotopes are very useful as indicators because they indicate key ecological processes and they integrate those processes over space and time. For example, we're measuring stable isotopes on water samples that are collected as part of NARS and also nitrogen isotopes on coronamids that are collected as part of the benthic invertebrate samples. The water isotopes indicate variation in precipitation that falls into the watershed. And then also the process that it's recording is mixing of different waters as they move through the watershed. And then the key point here is evaporation. So we can use these to try and look at parts of the hydrologic cycle. For the nitrogen isotope, it varies through space and time with the source of the nitrogen that's applied to the landscape. And then as it moves through the landscape, gaseous losses of the lighter isotope change that isotopic ratio. All of this is integrated together into the samples that we end up collecting, such as the coronamids or the water chemistry sample that are already collected as part of NARS. For our hydrologic indicator, we're using steady state mass balance equations of lake hydrology, where inflow I is equal to outflow plus evaporation and assuming no change in storage. I don't want to go too much into the weeds into this, but using the stable isotopes of the different flows, 
And just looking at the isotopes alone, we can calculate the proportion of water that's flowing into the lake inflow that's lost through evaporation. So this E to I ratio. If we know the lake volume, we can then convert this into looking at lake water residence time. And we've done this for all of the NLA surveys uh, so far, and we're collecting water from the 2022 NLA, and so we'll have them for that as well. Using the E to I ratio that we calculate from the lakes, we can then divide lakes into different hydrologic classifications. There's flow through lakes where most of the water flowing into the lake leaves through outflow and very little evaporation occurs. Those are ones that have less than a value of 0.4. So a value of 0.4 means that 40% of the water would leave through evaporation and 60% would leave through uh, outflow. Ones that have an E to I ratio higher than 0.4 are considered restricted basins. And ones that have higher than one mean that all of the water is leaving through evaporation and there is no outflow. And if they're much greater than one, then these are desiccating lakes. This figure shows those classifications that I talked about, the through flow, restricted and closed basin, um, as they're estimated for the population of lakes from all three of the surveys that have already happened for the lakes. This is a population for all lakes here, uh, for natural lakes and for man-made lakes here. And you can see that the majority of lakes within the United States have evaporation to inflow ratios less than 0.4. So most of the water flowing into them is flowing back out again. But we do have a significant proportion of restricted flows, but very, very little closed basin flows. Man-made lakes have lower evaporation compared to natural lakes, and natural lakes have more variability over time. One of the more important aspects of this E to I ratio as our hydrologic indicator is that it's strongly related to the nitrogen concentration within lakes. If you look here, we've got the E to I ratio plotted along the bottom from zero to one, and then total nitrogen concentration within the lake here. And notice that this is a log scale. And we've got all three of the surveys that have been completed to date. And this relationship is very strong for natural lakes that we have in this figure. And for all three surveys, that relationship seems to be fairly uh, robust over time. For man-made lakes over here, the relationship isn't quite as strong but it is also quite robust. And here you can also see that many more of the man-made lakes are in that flow through status of the low E to I ratio. We're linking the E to I ratio with other measures of NLA lake drawdown. And we're using structural equation modeling as an approach to try and understand some of the drivers of lake hydrology. And in particular, we're trying to elucidate the human hydrological influences on these measures of lake hydrology. Now we're moving along to the nitrogen isotopic indicator. Nitrogen concentrations and nitrogen pollution across the US has been a huge problem over time. And in this figure, this is from the Enviro Atlas, you can see the application of synthetic nitrogen um, to the landscape in these different colors with very, very high amounts of nitrogen in these Midwestern states. And one of the ones we want to know, or indicator we'd like to know, are what are the sources of nitrogen in our different NARS surveys and how are they related to the concentration? We know that the total nitrogen concentration in the rivers and streams is driven by how much nitrogen is applied onto the landscape. And in this case, we have the 2008-9 um, National Rivers and Streams Assessment, the total nitrogen concentration plotted here, again on a log scale, against fertilizer inputs across the watershed. And while we have a strong relationship here, there's a lot of variance that's unexplained. 
And so we're trying to look at and understand how the nitrogen isotopes might be able to help explain this variation. Here's the same figure, but now I've highlighted the coronamid 15N values with the low isotopic values in blue and the high isotopic values being in red. And you can see differences in the relationship associated with that. So let me just walk you through this. If we just focus in where fertilizer inputs into the landscape are high, and we know that the source is synthetic fertilizer, now we see a relationship with an increasing 15N of the coronamids has a decrease in the nitrogen concentration in the streams themselves. This high N15N is indicating removal across the landscape. So nitrogen is being removed, ending up in lower nitrogen concentrations within the streams. At the other end, when fertilizer inputs are low, we see the opposite sort of relationship. Here, the N15 value, as it increases, we see increasing nitrogen concentrations in streams. This is indicating inputs from either manure or sewage that have an enriched 15N signature. And so using this, we can end up classifying watersheds depending upon how they're processing nitrogen and potentially what their sources of nitrogen are. This is an example of classification for watersheds based on three pieces of information, the nitrogen concentration in the streams, the loading of nitrogen onto the watersheds within each of the NARS locations, and the N15 of the coronamids. There's a lot of information in here, but mostly what I wanted you to focus on were these red and green dots here into the center. These are areas where nitrogen loading onto the landscape is very high. In the red locations, these are places where the nitrogen is moving very rapidly through the watershed and ending up into the stream with little amounts of processing and has high nitrogen concentration. Mixed in and right around them are the green ones. These are the locations where nitrogen is application to the watershed was high, but now there's a lot of processing causing the N15 to go up and the nitrogen concentrations are much lower. It would be nice to be able to figure out what's going on into these watersheds and turn the red ones into green ones if we had more information. I've briefly touched on two of the different indicators that we're developing for uh, NARS based on stable isotopes, those for the lake hydrology indicators um, and also then the insects. But we're also looking at soils within wetlands as part of the National uh, Wetland Condition Assessment. And then we're also looking at the water isotope within rivers and streams, looking at water sources, which parts of the watershed are contributing more water than other parts of the watersheds. And all of these are things that we're doing with the water isotopes that are already being collected on samples that you have. This presentation has been a brief overview of some of the work that we've been doing with stable isotopes as indicators for the NARS surveys. We've generated a lot of data over the last decade, and we're happy to share that data with you for your locations and states or any others that you might be interested in. So mostly what I'd like to say is, is here's my contact information. If you have any questions or would like more information, particularly regarding um, data for your states, uh, just contact me and let me know. Thanks, and thanks for listening. Thank you. That was uh, that was fascinating, and uh, more more bang for your buck, indeed. Um, it's exciting to see what we can learn and what the implications are to better understanding those sources of nitrogen, and uh, in terms of of not only understanding what's going on, but in ultimately turning turning those red red uh, watersheds into green ones. So. Um, with that, I'm going to open it to questions and see if there are any questions uh, for Renee. I'm watching the chat box. I, I did want to say that I think um, some of the earlier isotope data is available through the NARS website. So some of the data is already up 
um, and it's available there, but I'm not sure that all of it is. Great, thank you. All right, now I know we're we're coming to the bottom of the hour and the uh, the end of our program. So I'm gonna just watch that chat box for another moment, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm also going to uh, to take the opportunity to uh, uh, plug one more time the, uh, whoops, here we go. Uh, are you starting to look at the green watersheds? Asks Sarah Lehman. Um, we're not doing any sampling outside of what we're already doing as part of NARS, but we have been looking at characteristics of the green ones. They have more forested areas, they have more wetlands in them. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to look at, but uh, it's very, it varies a lot, I think, uh, across regions. That's great. Here's one from Catherine Hine. Have you compared the E to I ratios with overland hydrology? I'm curious about seepage versus drainage, uh, natural lakes, and thinking about the extent of groundwater outflow in seepage lakes? Um, so the, part of the outflow, you know, uh, it, is, it is considering whether or not you have outflow, whether it goes through groundwater or surface. So that's all part of the outflow. The only thing it's really quantifying is the evaporation signal associated with that. Um, and we have looked a little bit at that. Uh, our postdoc, Amy Fergus, has been working a little bit on some of those within the 2012 NLA. And it, you know, it, it makes a difference, of course. You know, yeah, if the, the more outflow that you have, I mean, that's, it, it's kind of more of a classification looking at E to I that kind of gets into that, the seepage drainage uh, component within that or closed basins. But you'd be able to know whether something really was closed in that there was no outflow or whether or not there was a significant amount of groundwater flow out. That would be something you'd be able to tell. And either way, they'd be considered an outflow lake. Yeah, doesn't matter which pathway it takes out. Got it, got it. Uh, and uh, Catherine Hine is saying the amount of groundwater exchange is often hard to say on a seepage lake. Which yeah, yeah. Certainly seems logical. That's great. Are there any other questions? All right, so we're gonna put these um, presentations onto YouTube. So again, searching Conservation Technology Information Center on YouTube, but we'll also send you a uh, link to, to all participants or all registrants in this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, that location also has the last webinar, which was the history of NARS. Um, and in the chat, uh, Callie's put the, um, the YouTube uh, address as well. Um, we hope to see you all and many others uh, on April 5th, 6th, and 7th be in the afternoon Eastern time when we do our national NARS workshop. Um, we're gonna make the most of the opportunities that we have to bring the, the whole world together um, in the absence of being able to meet in person. Um, so please do join us. And um, again, I really wanna thank our speakers today. Uh, and apologize for the audio problems. They put in an awful lot of work to, uh, to make these presentations happen and to share their insight with us. Um, and uh, uh, despite the audio, I, I, I hope uh, you all found this to be uh, both useful and enlightening. So um, thanks again, and uh, we will see you in April. <laughs>